Is the American dream alive and well? If you ask today's guest, Ken Langone, he'd certainly say yes. In his early years, Ken spent time in the U.S. Army and dug ditches for the Long Island Expressway before going to Bucknell University to study economics. After graduation, he began a career on Wall Street and earned his MBA at NYU. He then became an early investor and co-founder of a little company called The Home Depot, which is today's largest home improvement retailer. Today, Ken sits as the chair of the Board of Trustees at NYU Langone Medical Center. In this episode, Ken and Jim touch on the entrepreneurial spirit at the core of both Ken and Jim's careers. Knowing you as a, a friend and a and a mentor and as a hero, you know, the big public achievements in your life, obviously the career you had on Wall Street, creating your own investment firm, all the Wall Street victories you had. And then, of course, the financing and founding of uh, Home Depot, huge, big, big public success and uh, an amazing, amazing accomplishment. And now uh, uh, the whole NYU Langone chapter, which I frankly think is your biggest professional accomplishment. By, by far, Jim. The greatest satisfaction, other than my family, is the medical center. And, and to reach the number one status as a teaching health system by so many counts uh, in, in the period of time that you've done. And of course, if you're the, the best teaching health center in the United States, you're de facto the best teaching health system in the world. What an amazing, amazing uh, oh, accomplishment. And what a team you built. I'm a student of business, I'm a student of culture, and there, every time I interact with the team there is a, at a board meeting or whatever interaction I have, I'm amazed at the sense of culture that exists at NYU Langone. Thank you, Jim. Well, you know, Jim, I tell people, people have asked me the question, what do we do different at Home Depot that we, did, that we didn't do at the medical center? And I shock them, I say, let me tell you the truth. The same thing that we did to motivate the kids on the floor in the store with aprons on. These are kids that barely get out of high school. We do with the doctors that have got any number of degrees and are neurosurgeons and are scientists of the highest order. We all want to feel like we can matter. I don't care what your walk in life is or what your station in life is. You want to wake up in the morning and say, you know what? I'm getting up today and I'm going to make a difference in the world. I matter. Saying it is one thing. Living it is something else altogether. You know, you walk past a guard in the lobby at the hospital and you, you go up to them and you say to them, hey, listen, thanks so much for all you do for us. Our patients are very appreciative of what you do. Cost you nothing. But when you walk away from the guy, he says to himself, hey, you know what? I'm not just a guard. I'm on the team. I matter. I make a difference. And I've been in your company walking down the street when you've done that with people in police uniform. Uh, and you yeah, thank well, them for their service. And, you know, as corny as it is and seems, to see the expression on that office's face, which a second yeah. ago was grizzled and now is warm and, uh, and, uh, and thoughtful, uh, it makes a difference. And as you say, what does it cost us? Nothing. And yet, but, you know, Jim, you got to be careful because in doing it, you've got to be sincere. I, I tell people, that the three most powerful forces I know in life are a kind word, a thoughtful gesture, and passion and enthusiasm for everything you're doing. Look at what you've done with flowers. Look at what you've done with Harry and David. People know, Jim, that it's not just an investment or it's not just a company, it's a way of life. And, and people know that when you put your name to something, it takes on special meaning over and above and beyond whether you make money or whether you create jobs, all those things are important. But the most important thing is for people to know, hey, this guy really is into this thing. He means it. And I want to be part of it. And you know, it, uh, uh, it reminds me of two things re directly related, uh, Ken. That is, uh, people make fun of the fact that I, I, when I'm in the office, whatever office I'm in, I'm walking right. around. I want to meet people. And I can't walk past a piece of paper on the floor without bending over to pick it up. Now, I will tell you, it takes me a little longer to get up now than it used to, <laughs> but I still do it. And I just can't help it. It's how my, I was raised. Well, and, you know, that's, it. that's interesting. You mentioned that. When I walk a Home Depot store, I usually have eight or nine kids. They'll get around me and we walk the store and look for the 
in stocks and look at what's the new products and so forth. And honest to God, I pray to God, there's something, a piece of litter on the floor that I can bend down and pick it up. Now, the kid will come to me and say, I'll, I'll get rid of that. And I'll say, no, no, I'll wait till I find a waste beer. Something as simple as that says to them, hey, you know what? He's doing the same thing I'm doing. So what I'm doing matters because if he's doing it, it must matter. People need to know that they're part of whatever the achievement is. And you do that, Jim, and watch just the human energy that pours from these people in a very constructive, positive way. The simple littlest things, it costs you nothing and it means everything to go to somebody and say, boy, am I glad you're here because you're going to make a difference. Kids ask me all the time about books I read, business books, and I always say to them, if I could only give you one book to read for business, it would be the Holy Bible. Every single lesson that you've applied to give you the success you've had and what I've applied to give me is in the Bible, Jim. Every single one of them. It's not, a, it's not in this. I Love Capitalism, an American right. Story by Ken Langone, which, and, by the way, only came out a few years ago, Ken. But now you can't even find it. They got to reprint it. I know. They're doing that now. I have to apologize to people when they see them for the bad words. Yeah, You know the story of that. Cardinal Dolan came down to Florida to speak at Lost Tree. We have a series of speakers in the wintertime. And he walked up to the podium. He had two books. One was that book. And he had another book twice as thick. And he got up and he said, he put the books up. He said, now the book on my right is Ken's book without the swear words in it. And the book on my left is Ken's book with the swear words in it. <laughs> well, I, I'm trying to learn that, uh, as you say, at any age, we can continue to learn. And I'm trying to learn Absolutely. that. And one of the things I think that COVID has taught us is when you don't, it's not just a big and important relationships. It's not just the love of your wife or your right. children, but it's all those little incidental contacts we have throughout our day, throughout our lives, or at least we did pre-COVID that really do accumulate to a body of feelings and relationships and variety of relationships. It's seeing the same usher when you walk into St. Pat's every day uh, and, and saying hello or waving across the, the way at them. It's all those little ins that accumulate into our body of feeling about who we are, what we're worth, and what's important to us in life. And the lesson I learn every day is it's all about relationships. Jim, you know, I, uh, when, I, when I was running Pressbridge, we had 300 salesmen. I used to say to the salesmen, remember one thing, you're a salesman. The one thing I can guarantee you is people like to do business with people they like. So whatever you're going to do, before you try to sell a guy a bond or a stock, make sure they like you. Get to know them. Make, make Exactly. Make the effort. Be genuine. Be uh, uh, authentic. Let them know when you ask them how their family is, you really care how their family is. But you're not just mouthing words that have no feelings or emotion behind them. There's a fellow who uh, you convinced to have this small, reasonably uh, unknown firm uh, take them public. A company, uh, by the, and they, uh, a fellow by the name of Ross Perot. Tell oh, us, sure. how, did you, how did you get to know Ross and how did you develop a relationship? I got to know Ross. I was at a dinner in Washington on a Saturday night. And the guy sitting next to me at dinner turns out to have been one of Ross Perot's partners. And he mentioned to me they were going to go public. And he was telling me about the company. And I said, gee, that sounds intriguing. I said, is there any chance? And by the way, Jim, I'd never done an IPO before. Get out. <laughs> never done one. He said they were, getting, they were interviewing underwriters. And I said, is there any chance that we can get a chance to talk? And he said, sure, I'll give you a call. So Monday he called me. He was back in Dallas. He said, Mr. Perot, I'll see you Wednesday at 11.30. When you walk in at 11.30, be there on time. You got 30 minutes at 12 o'clock. Say goodbye. He's very precise on time. 11.30, the door opens just exactly as Jack Height, that was the phone's name, tells me. I sit down. Hi, fellas, Ross Perot. Hello, Mr. Perot. Come on, you know. Well, these fellas, you know, we're getting ready to go public. He said, let me tell you what I'm hearing from all these fellas. 
he talked about what Goldman said and what Merrill said and what Whitewell said and kid a Peabody. And when he got done, he said, what do you think of what I said? I go, well, Mr. Perot, I said, it's about one minute to 12. I think I'll say goodbye. Maybe the next time I'm down this way, I'll get some time that I can share with you about what we do. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I was told that you've got a very busy schedule and 12 o'clock was all you got. No, he said, forget that, forget that. What do you think of what I said? Now, Ross was notorious for not using bad words. And I sat there for a minute and I said, what do you do? And I said, Mr. Perot, with all due respect, that's the biggest pile of horse shit I've ever heard in my life. And he went back. <laughs> what do you mean? We talked for 13 hours. We talked, we, we talked until one o'clock the next morning. He was driving me around Dallas that night looking for a drugstore because I was going back on a three o'clock in the afternoon plane, <laughs> looking for a toothbrush and toothpaste, <laughs> waving stuff. And so then he was going to make his decision on who he was going to use the following week. The following Monday, this I was with him on a Wednesday. The following Monday, he called me and said he was pushing back the decision. He wanted to get to know me a little better. And could I when I come down to see him, could I bring down the prospectuses of all the deals I've done? <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> this, this, this is going to be the shortest act on Broadway. So, <laughs> so I get down there and I'm whole praying to God he forgot he asked for it. By the way, every time I came to see him, he would pick me up at the airport and he would bring me back. He would drive himself. Always did it. So we, we, we met for another three hours and we talked how would I would do this, how I would do that. I said, Mr. Perot, at the end of the day, the bet you're making is, I'm going to tell you what I think your company's worth. And your bet is, can I sell the stock at the price I told you it's worth? That's your bet. Yep. I said, it's that simple. And if you have faith in the person and your judgment's right, you're going to have a good deal. So anyway, nothing was said about the prospect eye. We drive to the airport. I get out of the car and I go, thank God, he never brought it up. Just as I'm getting out of the car, he's, by the way, he said, did you bring those prospecti down with you? I said, no, sir, I didn't. You forget them? I said, no. Where are they? I said, there aren't. He said, what do you mean? I said, you'll be the first. And he looked at me, he says, you've never done a deal before? I said, I've never done a deal before. But I said, if I can't do this deal, I'll quit. <laughs> and so all I can tell you, Jim, uh, he and I had a relationship predicated totally on openness and honesty. To know him and have him as a friend was one thing. But when the family asked me if I deliver a eulogy at his funeral, that was about as good as it got. And, and uh, the, when you ask how the relationship was formed, it was always formed on a basis of honesty and directness. He... Uh, he was going to take over a baking company, Campbell Taggart Baking Company. And he needed $100 million. And we were up at New England Mutual Insurance to borrow the $100 million. And in the meeting, it was clear that what New England Mutual needed to get it done, Ross would have a problem with. So I'm trying to figure a way out to give them something of what they need and yet get the deal done. We went back to the hotel and Perot was in a fit. He said, you work for me, you work for them. I said, I work for you. Well, damn it, listen to that meeting with you and them, you're conniving with them to get me. And I said, Ross, every single thing I said to them was predicated on, was it good for you? And I said, if you'd like, Let's stay right here. And we sat in the hotel room and I went down point for point of how he benefited by what I was proposing to them, better than what the deal was that he wanted. And the last story I'll tell you. So funny story. what happened to the deal? Oh, we didn't do it because the baking company was a mess. And thank God we didn't do it because he'd have been in a hole a hundred million bucks. Wow. And the last story I'll tell you about him was the night before People, years ago, there was a transfer tax in New York State. So when you did an underwriting, you signed all the documents in Jersey. So the deal was technically done in Jersey. Uh -huh. New York State transfer tax. The night 
before the IPO, Margo and Roy. This is EDS's uh, IPO? EDS's IPO, September uh, 1968. Ross and Margo and Elaine and I had dinner at 21. And after dinner, Elaine had to go back home because the kids had to go to school in the morning. And Margo and I and Ross drove through the tunnel to New Jersey to get off the tunnel, to get off on the side, sign the document. And by the way, the witness was always the driver of the car. So we had a driver. <laughs> so we're driving, and I told him that I was going to do the deal at 100 times earnings, which is an insane number. Wall Street said, they're crazy. He can't do it. He can't do it. So we're driving through the tunnel, and we're in a limousine that's got back seats that look at each other. So Ross is looking forward, and I'm looking backward. I'm sitting opposite Margo. And Ross said, well, he said, I guess when you're going to tell me I'm not getting 100 times earning. I said, what do you mean? Yeah, so all your buddies in Wall Street told me, you said 100 times, but watch and see, Ross, at the last minute, he's going to tell you, sorry, Ross, the best I can do is 60 or 70 or 80, whatever the number is. I said, well, what do you ask? Well, you're going to do it at 100 times earnings? I said, no, Ross, I'm sorry. We're not going to do it at 100 times earnings. So he says, um, see, Margo, they do it all the time to us poor people down south. They get us up here and they skin us. They skin us. <laughs> I said, Ross, take it easy. Take it easy. I said, you want 100 times earnings? Damn right I do. He said, let me tell you about Texas. You put your hand out and you shake a guy's hand, you got a deal. I said, okay, we'll do it at 100 times earnings. I had winked to Margo when he was in his fit. She caught it. She says, well, Ken, she said, you're doing it at 100 times earnings. What were you going to do it at? I said, well, Margo. I was going to do it at 115 times, but he only wants 100. <laughs> and that's how it happened, Jim. And the rest is history with EDS. And, the rest huh? is, and, and you know, Jim, that was a pivotal point in my career. I was uh, 30, 32 years old. I'd never done a deal before. I had a pretty good record of selling in Wall Street. And I was betting on my ability to sell him and his company to investors. And I was right. And yeah. we brought it out at 1650 a share, which was 115 times earnings. And within a year, it was at $170 a share. Wow. An extraordinary yeah. guy who could just think enormous size things, right? Oh, yeah. He had, he had a vision about everything. You know, I see what you've done with your career and with your businesses and how successful you've been. There's a common thread that goes through all of us. And that's simple. And that's asking, what can I do to make the world a little bit better for somebody else tomorrow? That if I didn't do it, it wouldn't be done and they wouldn't have it. You know, uh, a little bit of putting somebody's interest other than your own ahead of your own goes a long way. Look, we're all tough deal makers. You know, we sit in a room and make a deal. I'm going to do all I can do to get the best deal I can. And you're going to do all you can. But at the end of the day, there are these wonderful people in life that turn their lives over to us and expect us to make these monumental decisions that will affect their lives. And they trust us that as part of those decisions, we're taking into account how much better we can help them live a better life. Ken, uh, speaking of relationships, at some point you decided to go out on your own. You created your own firm. <clears throat> and how did you uh, come across... Uh, these couple of fellas from Atlanta who thought they had an idea for a different kind of hardware store. I had a client in Philadelphia. His business was in trouble. He had some hardware stores. And I said, back then the industry was fragmented. So you had Rickle Pergamon Channel up here, Scotty's in the South, uh, Payless Cashways in the Midwest. They were all like fiefdoms. And they all knew each other and they never competed. But they were the first generation of Bigger home than centers. the neighborhood hardware stores. Right, home centers. Like Channel and Rickle and Pergamon. Uh, yeah, I remember those three names from yeah. uh, the New York metro area. And so I said to Gary Obama, I said, who's the best in the business? He was the guy in California by the name of Bernie Marcus. I said, he's bankrupt. He said, no, he's not. Well, sure enough, long story short, I went back to my office, looked in the manuals. He wasn't bankrupt. I called him up. Crazy thing, it was 1975. The stock was selling for two times earnings. Making oh, a dollar and a half. He was public? He was public, called Handy Dan Home Improvement Center. Yeah, oh, yes, yeah. And long story short, uh, I went out that night. I went out that next morning to meet him in, in LA. We hit it off. 
I ended up buying almost all the stock in the hands of the public for clients. His company was 80% owned by a holding company, 20% by the public. He persuaded me to sell my 20% back to this guy, bad guy by the name of Sandy Sigaloff. I told him, if I do that, he's gonna, you're going to get fired. Well, about a year before this, Bernie and I were walking through a new home handy dance store in Houston, and I was all excited about what they had done with the store. And he said, don't get too excited. There's something out there. If somebody does it, it's going to destroy the, change the whole industry. Tell me, tell me. Can't tell you. It's, uh, I don't want anybody to know it. So now I, I'm, we're back to where he wants me to sell a guy the stock. I sell it to him. Three months later, sure enough, Bernie got fired. Call me on a Saturday afternoon. He needs a job. He's got three kids. He's got no money. Arthur got fired. He got fired. I said, Bernie, how, how soon can you get to New York? I can get there tonight. It was around 2 o'clock Saturday afternoon, New York time. I met him the next morning. I went to Mass Sunday morning. I met him at Peacock Alley. And I sat there with him. And he had brought a lawyer with him to explain why he was fired. And uh, so I said to the guy, I started by saying, this guy, I, I need to know one thing. Is what's that? I said, is he going to jail? He said, what do you mean, jail for what? What, Bernie's going, I, well, it's, you can't run a company from jail. What company? What company? I said, we're going to start the company you told me about, that you wouldn't tell me what it was, but you told me that whoever did it would dramatically change the industry. I said, we're going to do it. Well, I've got no money. I said, don't worry about it. I'll get the money. That was easier said than done, by the way. I bet. And that's how we did it, Jim. And to this day, that culture, you used the word earlier, is what makes Home Depot what it is. And, and there was a time, Ken, a painful time, when you brought in a guy who you thought was really going to do a great job there, you, was, you and the team, mm -hmm. uh, a guy by the name of Bob Nardelli, who's an right. accomplished, terrific guy, right. but didn't have the same sense and importance of culture. He, he, to Bob's credit, the first four years he was there, don't forget, Jim, we were opening up 200 stores a year. We were opening a store every other day. Wow. All the mistakes we made in the stores that were in operation was camouflaged by the volume out of the new stores. Mm -hmm. We reached a point where we were about out of places to put stores. That, that's an important point of reckoning for big box retailers. You got it, Jim. The first four years Bob was there, he really fixed everything up, the low-hanging fruit, I call it. After he had benefited from the low-hanging fruit, he began to cut in on muscle, and he didn't understand the importance of the culture in the company, the, how important it was for that kid when he came to work every morning to say, I've got to do the best I can do for the customer that I see today. Bob didn't buy into that. Bob was a numbers guy. He was a typical big business industrial guy. Show me the numbers, show me the numbers. With all due respect, he did the right thing for four years. But the last two years, it was clear that he, he was going in a direction that was not constructive. And we we agreed to go separate ways. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, he brought a guy in by the name of Frank Blake, who turned out to be, in my opinion, perhaps. And he came up to the general counsel rank, right? He was he was a lawyer. He was a he was a he was a Harvard undergraduate, Columbia graduate, law school graduate, clerk to Justice Stevens of the Supreme Court. Only nine of them a year. Wow. Then then he went to the Department of Energy as the number two guy. Nardelli brought it. Nardelli knew him when he worked at GE. So when Nardelli took over at Depot, he brought Frank in, and Frank was our strategy guy and also our, uh, our uh, ancillary services like credit card and stuff. So when Bob, we decided Bob had to go, I called Frank up and I said, Frank, you're it, suit up. And he said, well, how much time do I have to think about it? I said, you got three hours. And he took the job, and Jim, all I can tell you is I would put Frank Blake up against anybody as a CEO in any industry I've ever known. Why? Why is that high he's praise? This, he's got great empathy for people, especially people. He has a capacity to take this enormously big intellect that he has and gear it down to let the newest kid who barely got out of high school feel like they're equals. And that in fact, in many respects, that kid knows more than Bob does. And Bob makes sure that that kid understands that. He instills confidence in people. He instills a sense of worth in them. The greatest thing you can do for somebody, Jim, is to let them know they matter. It, it, that's come out a few times in our conversation. And uh, it's not just the little people, because I remember sitting in your office 
and seeing a, a handwritten card that you got from Frank that still yeah. means the world to you. Yeah. Oh, I have a frame. Frank and I, the year he had the first year, Frank and I would talk at 630 every single morning, counting Saturdays and Sundays. Because he was brand new. He had no retail experience. He was thrown into this job. And I just knew he had it. He had, he had wisdom. He had humility. And that's the other thing, Jim. Of all the things I would pray for that the good Lord would endow me with, which he probably hasn't done, would be humility. There's nothing more rewarding or nothing more appealing to somebody else than somebody who's good but acts like they're not good. You know, you look, you look at, Jim, our faith, our faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. How much more humble could God be than to die on the cross mm. in our faith, right? As we think about the world we're in now, you've seen a lot. You've been active in politics. You've been active in promoting people who you think have the right values, the right stuff, the goods, like Frank Blake. You knew, even though he didn't have the specific experience, right. you knew he had the goods. Yeah. And, and so as you look around today, I had a conversation with a, a, a fellow we both know and, and think highly of, uh, Frank Luntz. Oh, and I, absolutely. And I was chatting with Frank uh, just maybe it was yesterday, and he scared me because he scared me about how concerned he is about the political climate in our country today. Oh, my. Because he thinks we're on the verge of some very negative stuff. Jim, I couldn't agree more with him. Is that right? I think, I think the polarization in America today, in fact, I met with Mitch McConnell two weeks ago, and I said, Senator McConnell, if you do one thing, if we get control of the Senate, I pray to God, the first thing you're going to do is pick up the phone and say to Chuck Schumer, Chuck, let's sit down and let's figure out some bills and laws we can pass that are good for America, that both parties will get in backup. Let's show the world that we can work together. Jim, the poison in politics today is disgraceful. Did you